Hello everyone, my name is Tom Pounder. I'm the online campus pastor here at New Life Christian Church and welcome to New Life Online. We're so excited that you're here and spending today with us at New Life. Hey, before we get started though, I do wanna just draw your attention to one thing in particular. It's that we would love to connect with you. Again, part of the thing of the online experience that makes it so great is that we get to connect with people and talk while the service is actually happening. And that happens in our chat room. You can go on YouTube, Facebook, or on our Watch That New Life That Church platform and chat with people from all over the world. It's fantastic. So right now, if you'd like, get in the chat room and say hi and where you're watching from today. We would love to talk to you a little bit more. Now, if that makes you a little uncomfortable and you're not ready for that yet, that's okay. We would still love to connect with you. And one of the ways you can do that is to go to newlife.church slash connect. You can fill out a simple connection card so we can get you more information about New Life. Again, we're so excited that you're here today and we hope you have a great experience at New Life Online. Hey everyone, I'm Cindy O'Connor, the Children's Minister here at New Life. We just want to give you some new information about what's going on in KidZone. We're really excited to let you know that we're having KidZone in person during the 9.30 and the 11 o'clock services. So if you want to bring your kids in person, we can't wait to see them. And we're just going to ask you to continue to register them. And you can register them at the New Life website, newlife.church backslash KidZone. We do this so that we can keep your kids safe and secure and we can maintain our security and our safety protocols. If you can't make it in person, we're still doing the Zoom call at 8 o'clock. So you can find that information also on the New Life website. We'd love to see your kids on the Zoom call. If you can't make the Zoom call or in person, we're still offering our lessons online for both preschool and elementary new lessons every single week that you can watch anytime you want. Again, at the New Life website. So we hope we get to see you one way or another, whether it's in person or online. And remember, all this can be found on our website at newlife.church backslash kidzone. All right, we're almost ready to begin the service, but before we do that, I just wanna highlight three simple things. The first thing is that if you have a prayer request today, we would love to be praying with you and for you. And our prayer team actually takes every single one of these requests and prays throughout the week for it. So if you have a prayer request today, whether it's for you or someone else, go to newlife.church slash prayer right now. Also, after the message, we're gonna go into a time of communion and offering. So right now, grab some juice and crackers from wherever you're watching from and make sure that you can participate and reflect on God's goodness and Jesus' sacrifice for you during this communion time. And then finally, you can do this now or you can do this later in the week, but if you call New Life your home church or you consider that this service has been a blessing to you today, we would love for you to give. All you have to do is go to newlife.church slash give. The great thing about it is that when you give, you're recognizing the blessings that that God has given you and you're giving back. And it just doesn't help the Chantilly area or the Northern Virginia area. This goes to help people all over the world. We are a church planting church. And so that means that people all over the world are getting to hear about Jesus today. So if you give today at newlife.church slash give, you're going to help people discover God maybe for the very first time today. So we hope you're able to do that. All right, everyone, well, we're ready to begin the service. I'll see you a little bit later in the chat room. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. I want to invite you to stand as we sing wherever you're at, whether you're here at the end zone or you're online. Let's all join in as we worship God together. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I 
I feel the presence of heaven. You open our eyes with just one touch. My eyes are open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can't move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. dreams again just one word in you by baby yeah. oh just one touch I feel the power of hell yeah. oh just one touch my eyes will open to see my can't help but believe there's nothing things through us, through the power of Jesus and the power of Jesus alone, let's sing. And I will believe for greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like the power of Jesus. And I will believe for greater things. Let faith arise, it all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Now I believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power. There's nothing that I can do. There's not Say 
Son Jesus, we we thank you that as that song just said, um, you call each prodigal your child. And God, that's who we were when we were far away from you, and yet you called us back to you. You called us through your Son Jesus Christ, and when we call Him our Lord and our Savior, you see us as your children. God, that's such a wonderful thing. We thank you so much for that. So God, we just want to give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, and we want to continue to worship you through this service, God. Would you speak to us today in a way that only you can, that we could take a next step to follow you more closely? God, we love you. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. everybody. How are you today? Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. I hope that today that you are able to spend some time to thank a mom or a motherly figure in your life today and share with them how grateful you are for their lives. I know that I don't, I, I, I entered today with mixed emotions because we lost my mom a few years ago. And uh, it's sad this, but I also choose to remember today as all the great things that my mom did over the years that she was here and the legacy she leaves behind. So again, take some time to share with someone else what they meant to you and how they impacted your life in a very positive way. 
By the way, I'm Tom Pounder. I'm the online guy here at New Life. We're really excited that you're here with us today. And if this is your first time here at New Life, we would love to connect with you. If you're online, there's lots of different ways that you can connect with us. One of them is to get in the chat room right now and just say hello and where you're watching from. We have people watching literally from all over the world. So we'd love to connect with you today. Now, if that makes you uncomfortable, or if you're here in Chantilly, <clears throat> a great way to do that is just to go to newlife.church slash connect, and then you can fill out a digital connection card so that we can get to know you a little bit better, and then you can get to know New Life a little bit as well and how it helps you and your family. And then right after the message today, Sean's going to lead us into a time of communion and offering. Uh, so definitely, if you've not grabbed your juice packet here or your, your communion packet here at, at Chantilly, or if you're watching online, definitely go grab some juice and crackers so you can participate in that right afterwards. Uh, we love to remember, every single Sunday, we love to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us, uh, and so we participate in communion. And then right after that will be a time of offering. If you'd love to give today, if you feel blessed by today's service, or you consider New Life your home church, this is a spiritual act of worship. And we feel strongly that everything that we give back to God, who's richly blessed us in different ways, that's an opportunity for us to be a part of what God is doing, not just here in Chantilly, but all over the world. So if you'd love to give today, all you have to do is to go to newlife.church slash give. Uh, there's lots of different things going on with that. You can give to the 28 campaign that we still have going on uh, this month. So we'd love for you to be a part of that today. All right. So again, it is Mother's Day. And so because kids say the darndest things, don't they? Right? They say the darndest things. I did a little Google search of great kids uh, Mother's Day cards and we came up with these. So we'd love to just share them with you, and then we could all have a little chuckle today. Uh, so my mom likes to drink wine. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's okay. Thank you, child. Thank you, mom, for being wonderful and caring, not making your meatloaf anymore. Hey, <laughs> hey, come on. Who, who loves meatloaf here? I, I mean, I love meatloaf. I mean, come on, mom. Or, okay, dear mom, you are the best mom I could ever have. I want you to bring me McDonald's. I mean, who would ask your mom to bring McDonald's? Okay, maybe Chick-fil-A? Yeah, okay, or Bur Burger King? No, okay, anyways. All right, let's go to the next one. Dear mom, thank you for doing everything for me, but why don't you let me have desserts? I, I like, I mean, okay, what's your favorite dessert? Yell it out to me right now. Uh, cheesecake for me, cheesecake. So if you're thinking of uh, spoiling me someday, it's cheesecake. All right, next one. All right, dear mom, happy Mother's Day. You're sweet as sugar, nice as rose. Um, you're helpful and kind. I always love you, but sometimes I think you don't. You're the best mom a girl can have. I love you, mom. Oh, come on. I mean, geez. Really, 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 really love you. Okay, um, is that the last one? That's the last one. So there you go. Hey, we are excited that you're here with us. We're excited that you chuckled with us as well. Uh, and Sean is going to be up here sharing a message, and we are excited to hear from him. He'll be up here right after this. Ah, well, good morning, everybody. So I just have to apologize to uh, anyone who came to see Mike Francis last week, expecting that uh, someone as dynamic would be back today. I, uh, I was sitting in your seats last week thinking, man, that's a hard act to follow. I hate to be the person who's following up next week. And I was like, wait a minute, that's you. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't have picked someone uh, as opposite um, as Mike Francis. Like, he's this commanding presence. He, like, tells people what to do as his mob boss. I'm that guy that's like, I think you should do that. No, we're not going to do it. Okay, okay. <laughs> have it your way. Have it your way. You know, he's Italian. I'm Irish, right? He, he's from this notorious crime family. I'm from this, like, middle-class, Jesus-loving family. He, he went to court five times, fought the system each time. I was once called down to the principal's office and spilled my guts immediately <laughs> in order not to get detention. Like, like, he made a lot of money by ripping people off. Like, 
I make a little bit of money by lifting people up, like polar opposites. I mean, if we were to kind of compare our presence here on the stage, like in how we communicate, like he's intense, commanding presence. He's like Metallica up here, like, whoa. I'm more like Kenny G, like smooth jazz, like, <laughs> like, like, all right, try not to fall asleep on me, people, all right? But, but today, as I, as I was thinking about, you know, Mike Francis last week, which if you didn't see it, you should go back and watch it online. As I was listening to him, I was thinking, you know what, his family and him, they've, they've gone through a lot of hardship, a lot of consequences because of the decisions that they make. And I was like, you never had to deal with a lot of that stuff, Sean, because of, well, your mother. Because of your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother that passed on their faith to you and saved you a lot of headaches and hardship. And so today, I just want to say thank you to my mom and my grandmother and their prayers and to just encourage you parents to not underestimate the influence that you have on, your spiritual, on the spiritual well-being of your kids. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, he says, no, man is, no one is poor who had a godly mother. Yes, and I would agree. I feel like I started many, many days ahead of everyone else and was rich in many ways, even maybe not materially, but spiritually and ahead of the game in many ways because of the godly influence that my mother had in my life. And so today I want to look at a passage of Scripture where we look at a, a story of a mother and her encounter with Jesus and her desire for her daughter to experiencing the healing power of Jesus. And we're going to mine this passage of Scripture for some truth that we can apply to our lives so that we can be at our best for the people that God puts in our lives, whether they're kids, whether they're neighbors, whether they're coworkers, whoever they might be. So whether you're a mom, parent, whatever, we can find truth from God's Word and apply it to our lives today. And so if you would, open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 15. Mark chapter 7, Matthew 15. Those books are about three-fourths of the way through our Bibles, and they tell about a story in Jesus' life, and it's the same story, but they offer just a little bit of a different perspective, and so we'll take some verses from each to give us a fuller picture of what's going on in this story. But before we jump into Mark chapter 7, allow me to pray for us and ask God to speak to us this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you, we ask that you would speak to us, that we, you would open up our hearts, open up our minds to hear from you, to challenge us, to encourage us, to help us take one more step in obedience, another step closer to you. It's in your Son, Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so Mark chapter 7, verse 24 sets the scene saying this. It says, he got up and departed from there to the region of Tyre. So Mark saying, Jesus, he's leaving his base of operations, his ministry base of operations in northern Israel and Galilee, where he's normally teaching people, healing people. And he goes to this city, this region of Tyre, which has historically been an, an enemy to Israel. He goes up there. And then verse 24 continues saying that he entered a house and did not want anyone to note it. He didn't want anyone to know it. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know it. That's a, a verse that raises some questions for me. Like, I don't know about you, but it raises some questions for me. Like, when I read Scripture, I like to put myself in there. I like pretend I'm a fly on the wall. Like, what are you talking about, Mark? He's, he's at this house. He doesn't want anyone to know it. Like, what? Like, what, is he, what do you mean, Mark? Like, is Jesus like, he like puts on a ski mask and he's like getting in this house. I don't want anybody to know me. Right? Is he like trying to, he's casing the joint because he's going to rob the place? Like, he's, he's tiptoeing in there like... I'm not here. Like he's trying to like pull a prank on somebody. He's trying to sneak up on somebody, scare him. I don't know. I mean, what are you talking about, Mark? Right? Is he going like covert op? He's got the fake mustache, the, the, the sunglasses on. Jesus, is that you? No, I don't know. No, I, I don't know. Like, what are you talking about, Mark? He's trying to enter this house and not have anybody know it. Well, Matthew's account of the gospel tells us that Jesus has he's withdrawn to this region of Tyre. He's, he's gone there to get away. He's gone there to retreat. He, he's gone there to get some rest with him and his disciples. He's trying to flee the crowds because, well, at this point in Jesus' ministry, it's really heating up. He had recently sent his disciples out, and they've gone and preached about the kingdom of God. They've had, went out and healed people. And so all these people are coming to know that Jesus is the Messiah, and they want to be around Jesus. 
And so after Jesus sends his disciples out, they come back and all these people start following him. They follow him to find this Jesus guy. And, and Jesus has just heard that his, his cousin John the Baptist has been beheaded by King Herod. And so he's popular, but he's going through all these roller coasters of emotions. One day, all these, this huge crowd of people comes to him, and it's a 5,000 uh, group crowd of men, probably women and children, and he feeds them with two pieces of fish and five loaves of bread. And so, yes, he's exhausted. He's exhausted emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and he needs to recharge. And so what does he do? He retreats. He retreats to outside the borders of Israel where we, he can be alone with his disciples and just spend some quality time with them. Which leads me to my first point of application, that in order for us to be at our best for the people that God puts around us, we need to intentionally retreat in order to recharge. We need to retreat in order to recharge. If we don't, we'll just be running on fumes all the time, right? We need to recharge our batteries. Jesus is doing that here. So my question to you is, how are you retreating? Like, how do you retreat? How, how do you get away? Like, do you know that, that mentally, when you spend time with God, quiet time, alone, you know, some people call it mindfulness, meditation, prayer, it's celebrate recovery, we call it practicing our conscious contact with God. You know what that does for you mentally? Like, like neurologically, it sets down new neural pathways to help clear out the stinking thinking. Like, like it actually helps you kind of clear out all that cloudy thinking, helps you to be more alert, be more attentive, helps you with anxiety, helps you with depression. And so we've got to retreat so that we can be mentally recharged, physically, emotionally as well. And so how, how, do, you, how do you do it? How, how do you get away? You know, I know for me, sometimes I'm like, I'm just going to spend some time at my house. I'm just going to spend some time at my house. Maybe, maybe you think, oh, I can just rest at my house. But what happens when you try to rest at your house? Right? But back maybe, maybe years ago, maybe you remember, maybe, maybe you remember this, people used to go to work, like they used to go to offices to work. Right? You remember that? Like people actually used to go to like factories and offices and, and, and warehouses. I remember one of my first jobs, I had this little time card. I had to like clock in and clock out. Like, and then you would go home and you would be able to kind of forget about work and you kind of could get away. Not so more anymore, right? People are working from home. And if you're not working from home, you got your smartphone, you got email, work's always getting a hold of you. And even if it's not work that's getting a hold of you, you're trying to spend some time with God and with your family. And what are you thinking? Oh, the laundry needs to get done. Oh, the, the flower bed needs to get weeded. We need to mow the lawn. Oh, that, okay, I've got to do some cleaning. And we try to rest, but we're always distracted. Distracted with our time with God, distracted with our time with our family. And so what do we need to do? We need to retreat sometimes, get a change of perspective, D distance ourselves from our to-do list every once in a while. And I'm not saying like you got to go on a two-week vacation, even though that would certainly help. But may maybe just, maybe some time, maybe, maybe this afternoon, Maybe sometime later this week, you get in your car and you just get a change of scenery. You go driving down Blue Ridge Parkway or Skyline Drive or Lake Anna or, or take a hike in Manassas Battlefield and just for a few moments absorb the goodness and, the, and marvel in God's creation and spend some quiet time alone with God and maybe with your family. I remember when I was about 10 years old, I remember I was in elementary school and my parents picked me and my sister up from school and they said, all right, kids, hop in the car. We're going for a car ride. And I remember saying, why? Like, oh, because we want to go check out the fall foliage. Again, why? It sounds like a waste of gas to me, mom. They're like, get in the car. So we got in the car. We drove around the southern tier of western New York for hours. We stopped at some country stores and some farms along the way. And I just remember being bored to tears in the back seat. It was not what I wanted to do as a 10-year-old with my afternoon. And yet, 25 years later, I'm telling the story of this memory that I made with my family, a time that was, I know, so recharging and refreshing for my parents as they kind of distanced themselves from their to-do list for one afternoon. Yes, we need to be intentional every once in a while to retreat in order to recharge. That's what Jesus is doing here. And, you know, he's trying to get away. He's trying to get away from the crowds in order to have some quiet time, but it's, it's hard. It's hard for him because he's becoming so popular. So verse 24 says this, that he could not escape notice. Yes, he could not escape notice. People heard, and all of a sudden, people are flocking to him. Kind of reminds me of what happened in this room just several years ago. 
One morning I came in here and there was nobody in this room. Nobody in here playing basketball, which I thought was kind of odd. Um, it was before COVID and everything, it used to be packed. And Well, that morning I came in here and they had the black folding walls dividing this court from that court. Still the only one in here. So I'm like, maybe they're getting ready for an event or something. But, you know, I'm in here. No one's kicking me out. So I'll just, I was shooting some hoops, doing the mic and drill, working on my layups. And then after a few minutes, I didn't have my glasses on. I was at this basketball court uh, and, and basket over here. I could see this really tall guy walk through those doors right there. He walks in. And then he goes and he walks over this basketball hoop over there, stands behind that black wall and just, I don't know, he's over there. I don't know. So I'm, I'm shooting hoops. And then about two minutes later, a group of three people walk in that door and go over there and they start shooting hoops with this guy. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I, I continue shooting hoops for a couple of minutes. Then I go take the basketball back to the front desk. My friend Nick was working the front desk at this time. And he goes, oh, Sean, you see Kareem in there? I'm like, yeah, yeah, good one. Yeah, Kareem, yeah. That guy is pretty tall. Kind of does look like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You're right. Yeah, that's a good one. He goes, no, that's really Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in there. I'm like, no, it's not. Like, why would Kareem Abdul-Jabbar be here? Like, he doesn't live here. Okay, he lives on the West Coast. Why would the NBA's all-time leading scorer be at the end zone shooting hoops with three random people? It doesn't make any sense. He goes, oh, it's Kareem. I'm like, no, it's not. I didn't believe him. So I give him my ball. I go back to the New Life offices, and it's a, it's a buzz. Did you know that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is here? What? <laughs> and so even though all of you know, his people were like, hey, we don't want it to be like, we want it to be a secret. We don't want anyone to know about it. A few of us sneaked back in the gym and asked if we could get a picture taken with him. So here's our picture with him. So you can, yeah. <laughs> you can see Pat Ferguson. I'm in the back of my tiptoes trying not to be dwarfed by the big fella. But in the same way, in a very similar way that seven foot two, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the captain, the, the Tower of Power cannot go anywhere without people wanting to take their picture with him, get his autograph, be in his presence. So it was for Jesus. Like, he, he couldn't even go anywhere, even here in Tyre, without people flocking to him. So this is what happens next, Matthew 15, 22. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. So Jesus is trying to rest and spend some quality time with his disciples, and here's this woman crying out to him. You know, and, and I, and probably most of us, would probably think, oh, man, man, like Jesus, he's probably filled with compassion. He sees this woman. She's in need. And not only is she in need, like, it seems like she's got some faith. Like, she's calling him Lord, son of David, the Messiah. We'd probably be like, man, I bet Jesus just drops everything. Probably drops everything. It's like, what do you need? What can I do for you? But that's not how Jesus responds. That's not how Jesus responds. Let's go back to the text. Verse 23 says this. This is how Jesus responds. Jesus did not say a word to her. Yes, Jesus gives her the cold shoulder. He ignores her, pretends she's not even there, which is a people pleaser is very convicting, right? Because the minute somebody says, hey, Sean, can you help me with this? Oh, yeah, I'll be right there. What do you need? Okay. Right? The, the minute my phone begins to vibrate in my pocket, I'm like, oh, someone needs me. Get it out right now. Right? The minute I see that email, I, I feel that urge to, to open it up. See, what, what's going on? I, I don't know about you. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm alone in this. Maybe I'm alone in this. Maybe it's only me who gets a text message when they're driving their car. It's like, I wonder who's texting me. I better, I better check it right now. Maybe I'm alone, right? And, and be the only one who, when you're in a conversation with another human being and you feel that phone vibrate, Right? You feel like you've got you've to check it out. Or if you don't, the longer you wait, the more the anxiety begins to build. Because you're like, oh, who needs me? Who needs me? Who needs me? Maybe I'm alone in this, but I don't think I'm not. I don't think I'm not. Because, you know, when I, when I was a kid, I played soccer. I loved playing soccer as a kid. And, you know, my parents used to come to the games. You know what they would do when they came to the games? They'd watch the games. I know it's a crazy thing to think about, like to imagine, okay? But, you know, I go, I go to East Lawrence Park, ride my bike around on Saturday sometimes, or I'm just here in the end zone. I'm watching kids play soccer. You know what the parents are doing? The majority of parents are... I'm like, your kid's only going to be 10 for a year. Put it down. Like, what are you doing? constantly looking at our phones. Yes, did you know the average iPhone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day? 
Yeah, the average, the average, you know, millennials, look at, you know, it's even higher, but the average iPhone user over 2,000 times a day constantly being distracted. Oh, this person needs me. Oh, this notification. Oh, you know, what does that do to our souls? What does that do to our quiet time with God, with our, our quality time with our families? It keeps us from being fully present. You know, Jesus, is, he's, he's fully present. Maybe he doesn't even notice. Maybe he doesn't even hear because he's so present and focused on his, his disciples in this moment. So here's the application. Here's the application. This week, spend some quality time with your family. Like, like at dinner. Have, have dinner sometime this week. No phones allowed. No devices allowed. No Apple Watches allowed. Right? Turn off the Wi-Fi. Look at each other in the face, eye to eye, and have a conversation. Right? It might be difficult. You're like, might be some silence for a little while. But, okay, do it. It'll be good for you. It'll be good for your family, good for your relationships. Right? If you're single like me, okay, you don't got a family in town, you know, invite your friends. Hey, let's go out to dinner. Go out to dinner. Say, everyone, put your phones on the table. Everyone's putting their phones on the table, Apple Watch is on the table. First person to reach for their device pays. That's how you do it. That's how you do it, all right? Quality time together, quality time together. And if you're really serious about this, if you're really serious, 24-hour fast. 24-hour fast from all things media, devices, no Netflix, no phone. Lock that phone away. 24 hours, 24 hours. And when you feel that urge to go reach for it, you know it's, yeah, it's time to detox. Time to detox from that addiction that we have to that stimulus of that text message, that email, that alert. And we can learn to be more present with God and with our loved ones. So speaking of, you know, interruptions, have you ever had to teach your kids not to interrupt you when you're in the middle of a conversation? Yeah, you know, whether you're maybe working from home now, your kids are at home, they're always, you know, bombarding you with questions about their homework. Oh, not now, not now, not now. Or you're talking with another human being, you got to teach them. I, I had a friend who lived out in the country, and his four-year-old was notorious for interrupting him. So uh, he, he tells his son, hey, son, like, when, when you see me or your mother talking with another adult, okay, you, you can't interrupt us. That's, that's impolite. So what I want you to do, what I want you to do is when you need our attention— you know, come up to us and put your hand on my thigh, or if I have my hand down here, you put your hand on my hand, and I will know that you need something, okay? And I'll, I'll get to you, but just be patient. Just be patient. Wait your turn, and I'll, and I'll get to you. I'll figure out what you need. And so he says, okay, Dad, I'll, I'll try. I'll try. And, you know, he doesn't get it at first, but eventually he's getting the hang of it. And one day, this son, his son, he comes running out from behind the house. He sees his dad's in the front yard, and he's talking with the neighbor from down the street. He says, oh, dad's in an adult conversation. Got to wait. And so he walks up to his dad and puts his hand on his dad's thigh and just waits. Conversation goes on for a couple minutes. Eventually it ends. And then he looks down at his son and says, oh, son, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud that you would wait. Be patient. Now, now, what is it that you need? And his son looks up and says, oh, I don't need anything, dad. I just want to tell you that the barn's on fire. <laughs> like, that was the day my friend needed to tell his son, there are exceptions to the rules. There are some exceptions, and an emergency is an exception. You know, and this, 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 this woman's got an emergency on her hands, and she feels it's, a, it's grave enough that she can interrupt Jesus and his private retreat. And so she keeps crying out. She keeps crying out, Jesus, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. And does Jesus notice? I don't know, but his disciples notice. His disciples are like, this is weird. This is awkward. She's making a scene. So, you know, they, they turn over to Jesus. Jesus, would you send her away? Like, tell her, go home. Like, we've got nothing for you. Jesus is off duty. Go home. And so Jesus, he listens to his disciples, and he turns to the woman, and verse 24 says that I was, I was sent only to the lost sheep or the, only the lost house of Israel. And which, you know, if I was here, I'd probably take it as like rejection, like, okay, go home. He's not going to help me. Maybe come back tomorrow. But this woman's like, oh, there's hope. He talked to me. He, he, he addressed me. And, and so she doesn't take it as, as rejection. She gets closer. She elbows her way through the crowd, elbows her way past Jesus' disciples, and gets on her knees, hands and knees, and starts crying out, help me, Jesus. You need to help my daughter. She's sick. Help me. And she's persistent. She doesn't give up, which is exactly how Jesus taught us to pray, right? And so maybe sometimes we would think, oh man, like Jesus has got to heal her now. Like Jesus has got to heal her daughter now. He's got to respond now. But this is how he responds, verse 26. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. 
ouch. Like, what? Like, Jesus, didn't your mother tell you that if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all? Like, we, I, thought, I thought saying nothing was bad enough, but now you're calling this woman and her daughter dogs? Like, what? Well, speaking of dogs, did you hear the story of the mother who decided to treat her family dog, their dog, as her therapist? You know, she, she, she needed somebody to just unload her problems on, and so once a week she would get alone with her dog, oftentimes in the car, and just vomit all her problems on the dog. And this is actually the picture of the dog from their most recent uh, counseling session. <laughs> yeah, the dog's like, wow, I thought I had problems. <laughs> like, whoo, you know, and this woman's got problems. Like, like her daughter is being tormented by a demon and now Jesus is calling them dogs. Like, this is bad. This is, this is bad. And yet her response is incredible. Listen to her response. She says, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She's humble enough. She says, yes, we're like dogs. We're in need. We're dirty. We're not part of God's family. We're not part of the nation of Israel. We are from a people that have forever been enemies of Israel. But can we just have your scraps, Jesus? Can we just have your leftovers? And I think, you know, the disciples maybe would be like, that's, that's a good point, Jesus, right? I mean, when we have dinner, you know, when we drop the pita bread, when we drop the olives, you know, the dogs come by, we don't chew them away. We allow them to clean up after us. And, and because of her faith, Jesus ends up healing her daughter. But I, I still kind of have to wrestle with, why does Jesus call her and her daughter a dog? Like, I got to address that. Like, what, what is he saying? What does he mean there? Well, he's not saying that her and her daughter are any less valuable than anybody else. He's not saying they are any less loved by God. But he's just giving an illustration uh, that's showing why he goes up to Tyre in order to retreat. He's just saying, hey, charity starts at home. Right? That's something my grandmother used to say to us all the time. Charity starts at home. Right? Jesus was very focused in who he was investing his time and his attention into. Geographically, he was focused on Israel. And, and relationally, he was focused on his 12 disciples. Jesus didn't spend a lot of time with a lot of different people. He actually spent a disproportionate amount of time with a few individuals. So the 12 and even three within them. And see, he, he invested in a few in order to reach the many. And, and at New Life, we're trying to follow his example. And so even though we know there are people all over the world who need Jesus, there are people in Pennsylvania, you know, D.C., Maryland, all over the world who need Jesus. We realize we can't reach everybody, but we can be good stewards of what we have and intentionally focus on our geography, these zip codes, these counties, and our surrounding area. But we can also invest in a select group of leaders who we train and we send out to make disciples and start new churches who then make disciples and start new churches and reach places like Kenya and Belgium and North Carolina and all the other places that we're starting new churches. And so let me just kind of illustrate the math to you this way, the, 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 the math of reproduction and what we're doing developing leaders and sending them out. Now, this is what Jesus was doing with his disciples, investing into a few and training them to reproduce and multiply. So let's say I came into some money and I say, I've got the deal of a lifetime for you. You've got to make a decision. I've come into some money and I will either, either give you $10 million today or I'll give you a penny today and it will double in amount every single day for a month for 31 days. What would you take? $10 million today or a penny that doubles in amount every single day for 31 months or for, for 31 days, one month. I actually asked that to a fitness class I was teaching this week, and one uh, smart aleck goes, I'll take the $10 million and invest it in double my money. I'm like, too bad, because in this scenario, there's a Great Depression, you lost all your money, buddy. <laughs> but most of us, I think most of us would be tempted to take the $10 million up front, and like, what could, a, what could a penny become in a month if it doubled? But let's just play it out. At, at the end of the week, if you took that penny, it doubled every single day, you know, you'd have 64 cents. Not getting too excited, right? Right? Okay. Maybe kicking yourself for taking the penny. At the end of two weeks, you'd have $81.92. Ah, far cry from $10 million. At the end of three weeks, you'd have a little over $10,000. At the end of four weeks, you'd have a little over a million dollars. Not $10 million. But at the end of 31 days, three days later, you know what you'd have? You'd have $10 million, $737,418.24. Yes, that is the power of reproduction. 
That is the power of investing in a few and allowing it to multiply. And that's what Jesus was focused on doing. And because of that, we have become part of the Jesus movement because people that have gone before us have reproduced, have shared their faith, didn't keep it to themselves, but passed on that baton of faith to the next generation. And so, families, as we celebrate Mother's Day, as we, we celebrate uh, the, the spiritual influence that we can have on our kids, don't underestimate the power that you have to pass on your faith to the next generation. You know, Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. It's true. It's always one generation away from extinction. And we actually see that in the Bible. One of the most tragic verses in all of Scripture, in my estimation, is found in Judges chapter 2, verse 10. Judges chapter 2, verse 10, let me set up the context with verse 8 saying this. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. Verse 10 is mind-boggling to me. Like, wait a minute, what? What does that say? After Joshua, after Caleb, after that generation, after they die, another generation rises up who knows neither the Lord nor what he has done for Israel. How is that possible? How's that, how's that happen? Like, sometimes I think, okay, we're like, hey, if, if I want my kids to know Jesus, I just got to bring them to church. I just got to bring them to church. But it's not true. Like, faith isn't passed on just automatically, but intentionally from one generation to the next. And this generation didn't do it. They didn't pass on their faith to their kids, which is mind-boggling. Because, like, like, their parents, the parents of this faithless generation, their parents were the same people who walked around the walls of Jericho, made some noise, and the walls came tumbling down. I'm not going to tell your kids about that. No? Not around the dinner table one night? Nope, not going to do it? What? Like, like the, the, the children of the people who walk through the Jordan River on dry ground. Not going to tell your kids about that story, right? What? These are the grandchildren of the people who walk through the Red Sea, who had God deliver them from slavery. They witnessed the ten plagues. You're sitting around the campfire with your grandkids. Not going to tell them about that. Like, how is that even possible? And yet, sometimes I think that is the way we are with our kids. Like, we're not going to tell them about how God has rescued us, how he's redeemed us. We're just going to assume someone else is going to do it and bring them to church. It's a good thing. It's a start. But we have to be intentional about sharing our faith with our kids. Deuteronomy chapter 6, before the Israelites enter in the promised land, Jesus warned. He warned his people. He said, he said don't think that your faith will just automatically be handed on to your kids. He says, no. He says, I'm the Lord your God. I am, I am the God who created everything. I am one. He says, I want you to tell your kids about me. He says, tell your kids about me when you walk along the road and when you sit at home and when you lie in bed, a.k.a. when you take your kids out of kid zone and you're driving home. What do you talk about? Ask your kids, hey, what did you learn today in kid zone? You know, when you're sitting around the dinner table, pray together, have a family devotional, share what God has done in your life with your kids. When you're tucking your kids in the bed, read Scripture together. Read a Bible story together. If you're looking for a great resource to read the Bible to your kids, here's one. The Jesus Storybook Bible. I'll admit it. I read it. I read it myself. Sometimes part of my devotional time. It helps me make sense of some passages of Scripture that I don't understand. I think your kids will enjoy. It's a great resource. Pick it up. Buy it. Read your kids some of those stories. Be intentional about investing in the next generation with your faith. You know, if you want your kids to grow up and experience the power of Jesus in their lives, don't solve all their problems, okay? Like, don't do all their homework, okay, right? Don't, don't, don't when they come to you with a problem, you know, they, they come to you with some dilemma they're facing, they're worried about something, they're going through a hard time, they need something, you know, don't, don't just solve all their problems. They'll never learn to solve problems for themselves, and they also won't go to Jesus for help. Like, like when they come to you in need of help, say, hey, the first thing, the most important thing that we can do in this situation is pray. Let, let's give this situation over to God. Let's seek His guidance. Let's seek His peace. Let's seek His provision. Let's see how He provides, right? I, I, I know, man, in a few months, there will be 
students from our church who are going to be shipping up, going off to college. Like, I remember doing that, picking up my bags, going a thousand miles to a college in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. I remember that was the first time in my life where I was like, man, this is getting real. Life is getting real. I got to figure out how I'm going to pay for school. I got to figure out how I'm going to pay for clothes. I got to figure out how I'm going to pay for clothes to feed myself. Like, this is real. And you know what that forced me to do? It drove me to my knees. It drove me to my knees and said, God, would you provide? Would you provide jobs? Would you provide me with scholarships? And for the first time in my life, you know what? I actually started applying myself in school. I actually started studying and reading the materials that I was supposed to be reading because all of a sudden I valued my education. So when you send your kids to college, don't feel the burden to pay for it. I'll maybe help them out, help them out. That'd be good. But don't pay for everything. Have your kids value their education. Work for a little bit. Get a little sweat equity in it. And then when they get out, they'll have more motivation to get a job because they want to put it into practice. So don't solve all your problems for them. Don't be their savior or point them to Jesus so that he can be their savior. He can be their provider. So whether, whether it is, yes, with kids or with family members, with spouses, with friends. If you want to be the best person you can be for the people God's put in your life, point people to Jesus so they can experience his power and his healing in their lives. Let me pray for us and ask God to give us some next steps in that regard. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, and we are grateful that we get to be part of your family. God, we are undeserving. God, we are sinners. We're broken. We're dirty. We're like dogs, God. But we need you. We need your healing. So, God, we thank you for providing that healing through your son, Jesus. God, help us to not, you know, be selfish with that healing, but to see the opportunities that we can pass that on to the next generation. Help us. God, this week to recharge, to rest, so we can experience more of your goodness, more of your abundant life that will just overflow from our lives and other people's around us, God. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So it's at this time in our gathering when we gather on a table. We gather on a table and have a meal with Jesus, which well, we're all unworthy of. You know, we don't we don't deserve to be here. I, I remember as a kid, uh, you know, coming to church every week and seeing my parents take communion. I remember asking my parents, like, when do I get to take it? And I remember my mom saying, well, when, you're re- you'll be ready to take it when you start following Jesus. Like, 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 like when you come to the point where you realize that you're in need of Jesus and in need of his healing and you're ready to make that decision to be baptized, then, then I think you'll be ready to take it. And so for me, I started taking communion when I was 13 after I made that decision to surrender my life to Christ in the waters of baptism. I'm not saying if you're you know, not baptized, you can't take it. That was just our decision, my decision, my conviction. But if you've not been baptized, I would encourage you to consider making that decision. I know next week we're actually having a baptism Sunday. Many people will be baptized, and if you've never made that decision of faith, I would encourage you to consider doing it. Take one of the flyers that we have on the seats and scan the QR code and get more information about how you can make that decision here. In the next few moments, we are going to come around the table and celebrate what the early church called the agape feast oftentimes, this, this feast that brought everybody together, children, grandparents, Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, around the cross of Jesus. As Mike Francis last week says, there's level ground at the cross. And so in the next few moments, I just want you to take the cracker and the juice and quiet your mind. Focus on Jesus. His blood poured out, his flesh torn, so we could be adopted into his family and experience this healing and his wholeness. So in the next few moments are yours. Take and let's eat, and then we'll continue our worship together.
Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you today. We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice on a cross for our sins when we were so undeserving. God, he went to the cross anyway for us. He gave us a grace so freely so that none of us can boast because we know we can't earn our way to heaven. We know we can't earn our way into some sort of right relationship with you except through him. So God, I ask that you give us clear next steps today for people who need to make decisions, that they would do so, that you give them the courage and the bravery to do that, to talk to somebody after the service today. And for those of us who have been following you for any length of time, God, would you give us a clear next step to be better followers of you, that we might be your people to share your love and your truth. And that's all because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. So God, we thank you for his, his broken body, um, for his blood that was spilled for us, but also for the fact that three days later he rose again, that we could have hope and that we could have a future with you. God, we just want to continue to worship you now. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, would you stand with us? And we're just going to continue to worship God together now. He's the only one who's worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, yes, we It's Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Again, he's worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. We sing all.
foundation of Jesus Christ and on him alone. And so we put our trust in him and he would continue to lead us and to guide us. And we can follow him better each and every day. So we sing this together. so glad that you were worshiping with us today. Go ahead and have a seat for a second. We have got something special today. Cindy, you can come on up. This is Cindy O'Connor, our children's pastor. She loves your kids. Give her a huge hand. And every year, a couple times a year, we do a baby dedication and a parent commitment Sunday. And today, what better day to do this than Mother's Day. So happy Mother's to all of you. Cindy, you take it from here and introduce all these cute kids and families to us. All right, thanks. Um, so we have five families that are coming up today. Um, hey, I'm going to get you guys to come in order because your babies are coming up on the screen in order. So can we get Isaac, Christopher, Cadino to come up first? His parents, Christina and Christopher. Isaac was born April 22nd, 2020. He dressed for the occasion. <laughs> Check that out. Then we have James, Richmond, Lindsay. We have Alicia and Jay Lindsay. And James was born February 19th, 2020. And we have Lincoln Michael McMillan, Kathy and Mac McMillan. And here comes Nate with them. Uh, he, and Lincoln was born November 20th, 2020. Okay, then we have, can we spread you guys out a little bit? Thanks, if you can. Rhett Maddox Nguyen. Beth and Eric. Beth and Eric have had a phenomenal week this week. They just celebrated their 10-year anniversary and got baptized on Friday. So yeah. now they're celebrating baby day. <laughs> Rhett was born July 29th, 2020. And now we have Robert Christopher Sire II from Shelly and Robert. He was born July 2nd, 2019. So these families all participated in our program that we call Baby Day Parent Commitment or Parent Dedication. We don't so much call it Baby Dedication because it's not so much about the babies. We're celebrating the babies. These babies are beautiful. But we're asking the parents to actually commit themselves to raising their children to know Jesus. And so in Kids Zone, we partner with you. We come along with you. We want to help you in any way possible. And that's what part of this program is for. We ask these parents to listen to three audio talks, one from Brett, one from Eleanor, one from me. We actually gave them a little bit of homework where they had to sit down and speak to each other, um, get a little time to themselves. I don't know how that happened, but um, to talk about what they, what they envision for their babies, for their children's character in the future. And um, 
Sean's sermon was spot on. I was so excited to hear the end of it because Deuteronomy 6, we talk about a lot, how you want to train your children and talk to them all the time and pray with them and do all those cool things. So these parents had to, um, had to come up with an idea and put it down on paper, and then we all got together for breakfast last Saturday. Um, without the babies, we actually found people to watch all their babies for them, um, and they got to share with each other um, what they got out of the talks and their homework, and they got, to sh they got to meet each other. It was a really cool experience for all of us because um, they see that they're not in it all alone, that they have people that are in it with them. Um, so hopefully that they can, um, can maybe do a little more together when they bring their kids to Kids Zone. Their kids will know each other, will grow up together. Um, and so we're really excited that they've come here before you um, because they want to commit themselves to raising their kids to know Jesus. Um, and they would love your support. And so we wanted to introduce them all to you so you guys can um, high five them and cheer for them, maybe babysit for them, bring them a meal or something, whatever, whatever you can do, but just encourage them um, to live a life for God and to raise their children to know that. So that's awesome. Can we give it up for these families? I feel like I'm totally in the way of that camera that just flashed in my eyes. Well, I'm so glad that you guys are doing this. Cindy said all of that very great. You know, Psalm 127 says that children are a blessing from God. And that means that they are a gift to each and every one of us. I say this as a father myself of three. They're not our kids. They're God's kids that he has blessed us with. And, and it's our job to be good stewards of everything he's given us, including our children, most importantly our children, to raise them in the ways of the Lord. As Deuteronomy says, again, Sean said it perfectly today, a beautiful way uh, to just uh, kind of wrap all of this up together. And we, as a church, you guys are not just bystanders, as Cindy just said. We get to participate with these families to help keep them accountable, but also to come alongside and support you guys as you are training up your children in the ways of the Lord. So I, I just want to say a quick prayer, and, and really for all of us uh, as parents, even if you're not doing this commitment Sunday, you can pray this with us to appeal to God for wisdom and his leadership as we try to be parents who, you know, don't screw our kids up too much, right? Uh, if you're anything like me. Uh, and also a reminder, call all y'all's mamas today, all right, because they birthed you and this is a perfect example, all right? So uh, let's give it up one more time for these families. And, uh, and let's just say a prayer for them, and then don't go anywhere. We've, we've still got a, a little bit to talk about. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for all of these families. Thank you so much for these beautiful children, uh, just the joy um, and the promise of, of who they are and who you've created them to be. And, and we get to watch that happen. We get to come alongside these families and these parents um, as pastors and as the body of Christ, as your church family. Um, to make sure that these parents know that they're not alone in walking through this life uh, as they are trying to raise their kids in your ways. God, would you give us all wisdom? Would you give us all your leadership um, to train up our children in the ways of you so that not only are they a blessing from you, but they can be a blessing for you, God, one day to share your truth and your love with those that they come into contact with. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Okay, give it up one more time for these families. You guys can go ahead and go on back down. So we've got one more really important announcement we wanted to share with you today. Our lead pastor, Brett, could not be here. Um, and so he, there's actually a video announcement we want all of you to be able to see because um, it is important. So check out this video, and then we'll wrap up the service. First of all, let me say happy Mother's Day. Moms, you deserve all the honor and appreciation that you get. Second, it's with mixed emotions that I share with you today that Stan and Risty, Misty Rada, who have served faithfully on the staff for over 11 years, campus pastor at the Linton Hall campus, teaching team member, Stan, friend, brother, overall good guy that they have accepted a call to a senior ministry role. Now there's a part of me, quite frankly, that's really mixed in my emotions about this. Selfishly, I wanna say no. Selfishly, I wanna hold on because they are family. They're, they've been so effective here. I mean, but unselfishly, I realize that it's really important for them to not only follow God's call, but also to follow their giftedness 
to where God could use them most effectively. For the last several years, I've thought, you know, Stan, I'm, it could be a great senior minister. I'm surprised that Stan has not accepted a senior ministry someplace else. So it didn't surprise me when we were talking a few weeks back and Stan talked about the, 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 the decision, the, the wrestling match that he'd been having with God. And though while he loves new life and he loves you, um, they really believe that God has called them to this new place. And so I would ask that you, first of all, you give them your blessing. Stan and Misty have worked faithfully here with us, have served God so well here. They deserve nothing less than the finest blessing that we can give them. This is not so long for Stan and Misty. I fully anticipate that they will continue to be a part of our ministry family in years ahead, that we will continue to work in, uh, in discipleship and church planting together. It just won't be in the same location anymore on the same immediate team. So as we grieve their loss, we hold them loosely. We want them to be obedient to God's calling. Pray for God's blessing on them. Second, though, pray for the continued ministry of new life at Linton Hall in Prince William County. God's best days are yet ahead. There's so much work still to be done. And Stan and Misty have done a great job in the last 11 years of reaching lost people and nurturing and making disciples. And there's just a great solid core of people who love the Lord and are committed to the ministry here at Linton Hall. And so pray also for our campus at Linton Hall, for that church, as we continue to aggressively pursue God's good, great future for us. That not only honors God, it honors what Stan and Misty have worked for all these years as well. So with that, pray for God's blessing on Stan and Misty. Pray for God's blessing with New Life Christian Church, both Chantilly and Linton Hall. Hope you have a great day. Well, I'm not going to ask you to applaud for that like the families. We didn't want to do a bait and switch on you guys, but it was important for us um, because they're actually announcing it uh, during the services today at our Linton Hall campus. So uh, we know some people here love and know Stan and Misty really well. It really is a bittersweet thing. I can say that as a friend of Stan and Misty's, I'm just going to miss them a ton. I'm going to miss Stan's beard. I can't tease it anymore, so now Tom and I are flipping a coin for who has to grow a beard next, because now nobody on staff has a beard, um, and so we'll find out what goes on there. But I'm going to ask you guys to stand. We're going to close out. Um, if any of you made a decision today, I know we had a lot of stuff at the end of the service uh, with the, the, the parent commitment thing, which again was so awesome, um, and then just this bittersweet announcement of Stan and Misty leaving, um, but really am excited. I'm so excited for for Stan as a friend, just following and being sensitive to where God is calling him. And honestly, just the respect I have for him as uh, he and I have been able to do ministry alongside each other, and he's been at New Life for, I, I think it's like 11 and a half years. Uh, and so they've been so faithful to us and to the Linton Hall campus and uh, been in such a blessing. So we're going to miss them. So let's pray for them now. And, uh, and then, as we always talk about uh, at the end of third service, if you can help us pick these chairs and carpet squares up, that would be great. It really helps us turn this place back into a gym. So uh, the more hands, the better. Uh, so let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. We just want to pray um, as a church for Stan and for Misty, God, and we want to give them uh, our blessing in the weeks ahead uh, before, the, before they head um, away from new life and into their new ministry. We want to be a blessing to them, let them know how much we love them, how much they've meant to us. Um, but God, also, we pray for them, for their family, for the transition of moving out of Northern Virginia uh, and um, moving elsewhere in the country. And for the church that they're going to, God, that you would do great things through that church and through Stan and Misty, God, that we all realize that we're a part of your kingdom and that new life's not the only church. We're not the only church in the only community. There's lots of places that need to hear your word, your truth, uh, and, and lots of communities that need your love. 
in your light. And so, God, we, we pray for Stan and Misty and that you would bless them in a mighty way, that you would bless that church in a mighty way. And, God, that you would continue to work at New Life, that you'd give us wisdom uh, and that you'd show us the opportunities that you have for us because I, I know I'm convinced um, I can't see what's up ahead, but I know you have a great future for us here as a church, and we just want to um, we want to be open and sensitive to that and ask that you would lead and build the church as only you can, God, and that we would just partake and be good stewards of what you're blessing us with. So, God, we just uh, pray your blessing on all these mothers today. Thank you so much for them, for the love that they have shown us uh, so sacrificially so many times. God, would you bless them with a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and and may we honor them uh, as their families. God, we love you so much, and we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Hope you have a great week.